Hi everyone, my name is Ollie. Welcome back to the channel and today we are going to be talking about the UK FPO reserve list situation this year 2022 for final year medical students. Now this has caused a lot of upset and anxiety for not just the final year medical students that are having to go through this process as have had to go through the process for the last few years but among medical students at all stages of their careers and education because this stuff may affect them in the future. So the purpose of this video is to go through what exactly is going on with the reserve list situation in the UK for medical students and try and explain the picture around it and how we got to where we are. Again, it may be a slightly long video, but it's very complicated and it's going to take a bit of explaining, so please bear with me. If you already know how applying for your final year jobs works, you can use the timestamps in the video to skip ahead to the bits you need. If you are earlier on in your medical school journey, I would recommend watching the whole thing. To try and keep things really, really simple, when you get to the beginning of your final year at medical school, so year five for most people, the time actually comes for you to apply for your first job, to make the transition from being a medical student to becoming a junior doctor and getting a job within the NHS. You will then move on into your foundation training, which encompasses foundation year one and foundation year two. This is currently a competitive process, it's likely to remain a competitive process, and the way this is done is when you apply for your jobs, you get a score out of 100. At the moment, 50 points come from the Situational Judgment Test, the SJT, 43 from your decile at medical school, which you will receive in a range from 34 to 43, depending on whether you're in the top decile or the bottom decile or somewhere in between, so nine points are modifiable. There are then five extra points available for additional degrees up to a PhD. Two points for PubMed indexed publications, usually research articles or letters to the editor for example. And all of these things go together to give you a score out of 100 and it is this score that is used to compare you to everybody else in the country, all of the other final year medical students who are applying for their jobs in the locations that they want and in the specialties that they want. That's basically how it works. So then how do you actually apply for a job? Well, without knowing your final score, and this is the real randomizer element to this, you must rank all of the geographic, what are called deaneries or foundation schools within the UK. Wherever you like, you rank geographically where you would like to go first, and then once you found out where geographically you're going to be, and usually you'll find out your overall score by this point, you'll then rank which combinations of six jobs you want, they're gonna take you through your foundation training. So what is the reserve list? Well, what we have to imagine is that within every department that exists within a hospital, they will need a certain number of FY1 and FY2 doctors in order to make the row to work and in order to ensure that all of the patients have enough doctors at any one time. That is to say that each department needs a particular number of junior doctors, it might be five or six at once, and then we can imagine applying that principle to every department in a given hospital that takes junior doctors, and then we can apply the same principles again to every hospital in the country that trains junior doctors. And this is the effective training capacity of the NHS, or it's the number of F1s and F2s that all of these hospitals together are able to support. And when I say support, I don't just mean that there is a gap in the rotor for them to go into. I mean the consultants to supervise them, the structured training that they're supposed to have, access to training opportunities, everything else that comes along with being a foundation program doctor. So, obviously, in an ideal situation, every single person that graduates from a UK medical school would have a job to go into. Or well, that is to say that the number of FY1 jobs and in turn FY2 jobs for them to go into would match the number of students that are due to graduate in that year. If you have 5,000 people graduating, there should be 5,000 jobs for them to go into. Especially since, and this is the first really important rub, that the NHS has a monopoly on medical training, first and foremost, so you can't do anything with your medical degree beyond going to the NHS when you graduate. And secondly, you cannot practice as a doctor without completing the foundation program. Or to be more specific, you don't get your full registration with the General Medical Council until you've completed at least F1 and you can't enter any of the higher training pathways or kind of do anything else meaningful without finishing F2 as well. 
You may have noticed, however, that this is not actually the case, as in recent years, medical schools have been under pressure to take on ever-growing numbers of medical students. We've also seen the opening of several private medical schools in the UK as well, which adds to this total number. So you have a much bigger potential number of graduating students than we did, say, four or five years ago. On top of that, expanded pool of people, the government has chosen to remove what's called the resident labour market test for doctors in the UK. To try and explain this really simply, it is a political thing that exists to try and protect workers' rights, and what it means is that if you have an unfilled job in the UK, in most industries, you have to show that you are making efforts to fill it with a UK national who is suitably qualified before you can recruit candidates from international venues. Why would you have this in place? Well, it protects your UK workforce, it stops wages being driven down by hiring international labour for cheap, and it ensures that obviously as many UK people have employment as possible, which is something that a government in theory wants. And what this most fundamentally means is that international graduates can now apply for the foundation programme and for specialty training later on, on completely equal footing to UK graduates. Now again, at the risk of opening a can of worms, because this can be a really difficult subject to discuss sensitively, why would you want to make it so that UK graduates had priority, say, for medical training in the UK over international graduates who may be exactly as qualified? The thing to understand about this is that most countries, in fact virtually all countries, apart from the UK now, are very, very protectionist over their medical training. If you've got to spend huge amounts of time and money in order to train doctors, then really you want to hang on to them, and, or at least you would want to dissuade them from going elsewhere. So giving them priority in training in their own country where they're already based is a good thing for most of them. We do need to be very clear though that this is a very, very small part of the picture and is certainly not a case of international doctors coming over here and stealing our jobs. That's not what's going on. This year, there are around 390 UK graduates that have been effectively displaced by international graduates coming in and applying for those places. This 390, however, does include UK citizens who have completed their medical training in another country and are coming back here to work with their medical degrees and UK candidates from previous cycles. But anyway, a long time into the video, what actually is the reserve list and what does it mean for you? Let's try and give a practical example. Let's say that there are 5,000 FY1 training jobs available in a given year. But in this same year, there are 5,500 medical graduates leaving UK medical schools. Well, as we've said, you get a score out of 100. The top 5,000, because that's how many training posts there are, will be allocated a place within the foundation training program, and the remaining 500 will be moved onto the reserve list in the order of their scores out of 100. If anybody should drop out of the top 5,000 for any reason, whether that is failing their final exams, whether it is ill health, whatever, if a space opens up, people will be moved up off the reserve list into those allocated places, just like with any waiting list. And the foundation program has actually been oversubscribed quite substantially for the past several years. In 2020, there were 258 people on the reserve list. In my year in 2021, it was 494, so almost 500 people. In this year, in the 2022 cycle, it is 791 people, almost 800 candidates on the reserve list. Now what happens when people stop dropping out? We reach a stalemate, everything stops, and there are no more jobs that can be created, but you've still got several hundred people on the reserve list. Well, the solution that's been done thus far is that the government, the Department of Health, simply creates more jobs. And thankfully, in response to negotiation from groups like the BMA, for example, in the past few years, there has been a job created for every single person that needed one. Capacity has been able to be made somehow. But the real difficulty moving forward is that a, we had no guarantee of this, kind of in the first instance, at all, and we don't know how sustainable this is going to be. It happens to be the case that they have managed to make enough jobs in the past several cycles. How long they will continue to be able to do this, nobody has any idea. So to start moving towards the end, why do we have this situation at all? 
Well, what we have to remember is that the NHS is a centrally planned workforce. It doesn't operate through supply and demand as it would in a free market. For example, if you were building a private healthcare company, you react to market forces that tells you how many staff you need, what qualifications they need to have and so on. The NHS doesn't really work in that way. It's centrally planned and a group of people have to get in a room and decide how many of each type of doctor at each grade we want in a given year or in a given period of years. And this is mainly the remit of Health Education England or HEE. And this is the point where we have to start asking some difficult questions and raising our concerns as responsible employees of the future because Health Education England were obviously very, very aware that this was going to happen, that there was going to be a massive oversubscription for the number of foundation training places available. Now, we do actually know because people that have worked at Health Education England before have come out in public on places like Twitter and told us that they were very aware of this. And not only that, but that there was an internal drive to liberalise the market for doctors. In other terms, to create medical unemployment because ultimately this keeps your costs down and it in theory allows you to select only the best candidates from your pool of doctors. In other terms, it helps keep wages low and reduces incentives to make things better because you're always gonna have a supply of people that is desperate for those jobs that there are, especially as the NHS has a monopoly on training and you can't go anywhere else if you're not able to get a job. But why do we recruit in this way with the sort of randomization and sending people all over and wanting to liberalize the market? Well, in practical senses, I suppose it ensures that all hospitals in the UK are adequately staffed because the reality is that most people, I'm not saying all, but a very large percentage of people want to go and work in shiny, prestigious, big London hospital and do their super specialist cool jobs. And a very small number of people want to go and work in the middle of nowhere in the rural north of England, for example. But those places still need junior doctors. They still need people to type on the consultant's ward rounds and do bloods and chase TTOs and all of the other things that you need junior doctors to do. This method of recruitment and sort of pseudo randomization does ensure sure that you are staffing all of these places, including the places that would never manage to recruit by themselves, even if those doctors aren't happy about being there. But like I said, there is a monopoly on training. It doesn't matter whether they're unhappy, they've got no choice. So that, guys, is my attempt at a summary of what's going on. I hope that's made sense. Now, thinking very briefly, what does it mean for the future? Well, the obvious situation is that any bottlenecks that we have are only going to continue to get worse because we have more and more and more medical students coming up through the pipelines. The years are getting bigger and bigger and bigger in terms of their cohort sizes, and there are more and more medical schools opening, as I say, increasingly more private medical schools, and those that take only international students so they can skim off that international tuition fee money. There is going to be a worsening bottleneck at foundation training and competition for desirable jobs or jobs in the places that actually are where people want to be is going to get worse and worse and worse. We know that the extra points for all of the things I talked about at the beginning are being removed. So the only modifiable things that are gonna remain, basically, as we know, are the decile. So your ranking in medical school relative to other people is gonna become much more important and the SJT. So people are gonna prepare harder and harder for that somehow. The UK MLA, the medical licensing exam, may have a role in selection, we don't know. The second bottleneck is gonna be at specialty training. Competition ratios are already really quite bad for virtually all specialties and they are getting worse, which means that you have to do more and more extracurricular stuff, publish more research, have more leadership training, do additional degrees, postgraduate certificates, more and more years out of training in clinical fellow roles without progression as there is a backup of people trying to get through this bottleneck. And the third big problem is consultant jobs because Again, there has been no sizable increase in consultant posts for all of these extra people coming in the bottom end. So essentially what we are watching in as non-catastrophic a way as possible is we are watching job security get eroded or at least progression get eroded because my prediction of the model that we're moving towards, as I think I've made clear, is 
Ultimately, the, the government doesn't want more consultants, even though it might say that it does. It's quite clear that it doesn't. It wants more doctors stuck in the sort of senior middle grade SAS type role who bring lots of experience and skill that the government can use but without paying them a consultant wage that is basically what i think we're moving towards or that is what the government wants and i think we've got a lot of lobbying and being very aggressive about standards for patient care to make sure that doctors are actually still able to progress in their training and i'm really sorry i have to say it but i don't think that it's a positive sign of things to come for medical students and junior doctors and it is one of those situations where the government is making their stance on what they actually think quite clear and if you have not yet committed to a medical career or you're thinking of applying but you've not pulled the trigger yet just maybe this is one of those times to reflect on whether this is the situation that you want to be stuck in might be worth it if you want to be a doctor then it's the only way forward but that's where we're at guys thank you very much for watching please be sure to hit that like button for me leave a comment subscribe and leave any comments down below take care of yourselves and i'll see you next time